Um, thank you so much for coming to Verso. We're really, really pleased to present an election debrief conversation with our best uh, feminist critics right here. Um, it's been really amazing to work on false choices during this election cycle and be part of you know, a contingent of the left that was consistently trying to critique her candidacy, um, and particularly on women's issues. So we're really happy to host this panel. Um, and then also we have bathrooms outside. If you take a right in the middle of the hallway, um, we have wine by donation, and we have books um, for 40% off. So I hope you'll take a look after the panel's over. And I'll be live tweeting with the hashtag false choices. Um, and we'll have Q&A after, but you can also submit questions on Twitter if you want to be anonymous. Um, and yeah, passing it off to Liza. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that most of us did not see this coming at all. Um, I know there are always some people who are really smart and know these things before everyone else, but I certainly didn't. Um, and, um, and, and it really, so throughout this project, I mean, one of the reasons that we, we did, the main reason we did the book, False Choices, um, I mean, there are a lot of reasons, but the main reason was we felt we were preparing people to oppose uh, the uh, um, horror that would be Hillary Clinton's neoliberal presidency. Um, it turns out that's not what we were preparing for at all. Um, so the, there are a, a lot of... Um, you know, we, that there's, there's a lot of things we need to think about um, in a lot of new ways. Um, and yeah, so it's not what we got, and yeah, here we are. Um, so a few, just a few things that I think a lot of us are thinking. It's awful and nauseating that many of our fellow citizens were at best willing to overlook Trump's sexism, racism, and xenophobia. Still more disturbing is that for some it may have been a plus. But many of us also place the blame squarely on Hillary Clinton herself and the elite feminism she represents. It turns out you cannot win Ohio with endorsements from Anna Wintour. That's just not going to help. So it's really important to kick that kind of politics now while it's down so it doesn't come back and give us more Donald Trumps in the future. Some people are already aggressively determined not to learn that lesson. I think a lot of you probably went, as I did, um, to the anti-Trump rally today in Union Square, which was invigorating and a beautiful show of human solidarity. It was also full of ridiculous statements. <laughs> Oh, there are groups like Pantsuit Nation who are doubling down on their identification with Hillary and her brand of corporate feminism. Some signs included things like Michelle Obama 2020. Really? I like her too, on a personal level. Just, you know, she seems like a nice Midwestern lady. But dynasties and this kind of rich person worship is part of what brought us Donald Trump. So let's not do that anymore. So with that, I, um, we are expecting Katie Helper. Katie, Katie's here. <laughs> That's great. Um, so um, Katie Helper is going to moderate this all-star panel. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them first. Um, so Helene Olin is um, a Slate columnist and the author of Pound Foolish, which is a very good book. Um, Doug Hammond is the author of My Turn, Hillary Clinton Targets the Presidency, um, which was an early, the, it was the kind of the first um, left salvo um, against um, this disastrous presidential candidate. Um, Elaine Tobin is an NYU professor with a special expertise in celebrity, which I think is pretty important <laughs> in this context. Um, and um, 
Uh, Megan Kilpatrick is a contributor to False Choices and uh, a school teacher and um, an education writer. Her chapter in False Choices um, details um, Hillary Clinton's um, disastrous um, adventures in education reform in Arkansas. Donna Murch is an historian and contributor to False Choices who wrote about the Clintons and the war on drugs. And that chapter was later published in the New Republic as When Black Lives Didn't Matter. Um, read it in either form. It's very good. Amber Amy Frost um, is a writer and um, also an NYU professor. And she, um, her chapter in False Choices is about um, um, Hillary Clinton's one moment of radicalism, uh, uh, which is you know, definitely worth checking out as well. And Catherine Liu is a professor at UC Irvine, and she, um, she wrote about Hillary Clinton and identity politics, um, and her dad, and in one of our um, many um, also very excellent chapters. And Susan Kang is a, um, is a political science professor at John Jay College. So, let's, um, Katie is, um, so our moderator, Katie Halper, is a Pepsi Katie, um, is a comedian and writer and a host of the Katie Halper Show on WBAI, which is also hosted live at the Commons. When, when is it hosted at I think the Commons? The yeah, the second Wednesday of the month. The second Wednesday of the month, and it is really fun to go live to uh, the Katie Hopper show. Um, so, without further ado, we can start. Great. Should I use that mic or one of these? You should use this one because yeah. there will be more. Hi, everyone. Hi. 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 Um, so, yeah, I <laughs> big underachiever of this panel, so thanks for having me. Um, so I guess my first question is how many of you actually thought or considered that we'd be having this discussion under um, President-elect Donald Trump? Actually, I did. <laughs> oh, I didn't know this. Okay, so why I think I was invited to this. Okay, so can you tell us why you thought that? Yeah, I think I can pull this over. Yeah, so share with me for one minute. Um, there were a bunch of different reasons, actually. Um, and I will admit, I wavered back and forth a lot about this. Um, can you hear me? No. 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 Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. No. Okay. All right. Um, I'll try to link the camera and do this at the same time. Um, and I should apologize. I have a cold, so I don't mean to sound like Donald Trump while sniffling all the time. It's really not cocaine, everybody. <laughs> Just don't take um, <laughs> Folks, no, I'm kidding. Um, all right, so why did I think it? I thought it for a couple of reasons. Um, first, I thought, realistically, we are a fairly misogynist country. We don't like to admit that. And I felt the first woman president was going to have to be the celebrity equivalent of um, somebody who both men and women really, really like, sort of a George Clooney or Julia Roberts. And I felt that was going to be an issue, however worthy Hillary Clinton was. I felt that was going to be an issue. I think second, Americans don't like dynasties. Um, I think third, it was very clear that there was um, a thrust to vote for Hillary Clinton simply because she was a woman, um, and that women themselves do not see themselves as a unified force. Um, 50, it's very hard, on a re if you know anything about market research or survey data, it's very hard to get 50% of the population or 51% of the population to agree on anything whatsoever. So by definition, that was going to be very problematic. And then finally, I felt that Donald Trump's performances in the early debates were wildly underestimated. Um, and I was just talking to Doug about this, because everybody thought I was insane at the time when I was talking about this, was there were two moments in the first few debates that really kind of like, I was like, holy cow, this joker is gonna pull this off. And I should say, I'm a native New Yorker, so I've been dealing with Donald Trump basically as long as I can remember. Um, you know, my, my high school friends and I would just giggle at first. It was like, wait, best sex I ever had is running for president? What? Um, but he, in the early debates, he had two moments. We knew there was a lot of resentment out there. They were um, upset. People were very upset about the level of corruption. And he explained how he, he wrote a check and Hillary Clinton attended his wedding. And I thought, that's really going to resonate. 
And then the second moment was, um, and I should say I cover um, personal finance a lot, financial matters, and if you're anywhere middle-aged and above, like basically your number one concerns in life are Social Security and Medicare, if not for you, definitively for your parents. And on um, the debate stage, and I truly forget if this was the first or second debate, you know, it was um, sort of this ongoing competition between um, Republican candidates as to who was going to cut Social Security more. Um, you know, Marco Rubio was like, I'm going to throw my generation under a bus. Um, you know, um, a few months earlier, Chris Christie had a semi-famous appearance on C-SPAN where somebody had called him up about Social Security, and he started screaming in, like, mild terms, you're a taker, you're a terrible person. Uh, it's really wild. You should go look it up, people. Um, and then Donald Trump just says, I'm not cutting Social Security and I'm not cutting Medicare. And no one has said this in a Republican primary in about 20 plus years. And I was like, he said what? Um, and those were the two moments where I kind of knew he was going to go all the way. Um, and then I would waver back and forth because I was like, oh, well, you know, he really can't be Hillary Clinton, can he? I mean, he's just such a joke. Um, but I was clearly wrong about that. So um, we now have best, what my friends and I call best sex I ever had, Donald Trump. Um, is now our press going to be our president in the next few months. So, anybody else want to talk about this? <laughs> I, uh, about 10 days before the election, I, uh, I was engaged in a debate with somebody on Twitter and uh, looked up the final polls uh, in the primaries. And from the last seven or 10 primaries, I noted that Trump outperformed his final polls by several points. I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's like five yeah. points. So it's not a small amount. Oh, and so I figured. He's hmm. trying to be a good male ally. Actually, <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Wow, you know, he virtually even the polls now, he's actually closing at that point. He said, if he outperforms like this, uh, like he did in the primaries, we're going to have a, a very unfortunate result. And when I first started my work on Hillary in July 2014, I remember uh, uh, talking to some of my, I had a few liberal friends then, uh, and I don't think I do anymore. Um, but I kept saying, she's a really, really terrible candidate. You know, people don't like her. The more they see her, the less they like her. Her politics are remnants of the New Democrat era of the early 90s, uh, completely wrong for the time. There's a scandal, you know, ready to blow up any time. She's really, really terrible, and you're going to regret this. And uh, they wouldn't hear it. They accused me of secretly working for Ted Cruz or something. Uh, and I thought, hey, okay. And so when they nominated Trump, I said, okay, yeah, maybe she can beat Trump. Uh, but then, no, obviously, um, um, her badness um, overwhelmed everything. <laughs> and I think it's really, really important. We should not let go of this. You know, the Democrats are trying to blame everything else but their shitty candidate and her shitty politics. And it's really, she is responsible for a large part of Donald Trump. And we can't let them get away with that. And like Liza mentioned earlier when we were at this demo of Union Square today, you know, I'm still with her, people were saying. People are actually carry the Clinton King sign. No, this is wrong. We need to kick these people down. And any kind of serious resistance to Donald Trump cannot get derailed by nostalgia for what might have been, uh, because they're the problem. And uh, you know, if they if they get involved in this anti-Trump movement, they're going to tell us to be civil and hope for the best and start preparing for the midterm elections in 2018. That seems exactly wrong to me. I think I'm going to be the like tabloid equivalent of like National Enquirer on this panel um, because I remember thinking, so I didn't predict it. I'm not, I didn't predict it. And the reason I didn't is I thought he's a bloviating asshat, but he doesn't actually have any policies. Surely people see this. Surely I'm not alone. I have smart friends and that's the problem when you have smart friends sometimes. You kind of don't have the dumb friend who says, we don't give a shit if he doesn't have any policy. Um, but I remember when the grabber by the pussy comment came out, in my head, which I will never trust again, a, 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 light, a, a switch flipped. And I thought, that's it. That's it. Grab her by the pussy. That's the fucking solid gold content, to quote my friends. <laughs> um, and in my head, I also have a scenario. I believe I might have stolen this off the internet, but I think I also might have invented it, so either way, I apologize. It's January, and it's a Kenny Bunkport, Maine. 
And Jeb Bush is like, hey guys, hey dad, hey W, hey cousin Billy Bush, I really need to fucking beat Donald Trump. Do you have anything I can use? And dad's like, I can't think of anything. <laughs> and W's like, I got nothing. And Billy's like, zilch. I mean, like, are you kidding me that you have this in your back pocket? <laughs> Grab them by the pussy. It's in your pocket, and you're keeping it there. So I, I think that all I would say is, not only did, did we not see it coming, most of us, the night, the morning after, it didn't look to me like Trump saw it coming. He looked like he was horrified a little. He hadn't even combed his hair. The New York Times didn't deliver their paper until 1 o'clock in the afternoon because they hadn't written the headline. They had one headline, and then they, some poor reporter at 6 a.m. was like, fuck, we don't have a headline. And, you know, like, I know Liza, no one got their paper. So it, it just is shocking. I don't think we should dwell on the shock for too long, because I think we need other things. But it, So I'm the opposite. I'm the one who is just like, oh, well, more of the same crap. It's whatever, fine. It's funny. I, I remember thinking he would win when I saw his speech. I was in Cleveland, but instead of actually watching it from the convention center, I watched it the way, from a way better place, which was a bar called the Tilted Kilt which is like kind of a refined Scottish themed hooters um, and like much more tasteful so the women are more clothed but they're wearing these kind of kiltish things and I remember for the first time because everyone in the media who you know inner circle people who had seen what his speech was going to say were like oh this this is just a new level of xenophobic nativist uh, homophobic racist sexist garbage and he gave his speech and it was like low-key normal Republican I thought um, and he does get, one of my favorite mentions, uh, moments, by the way, from this entire election was when he uh, gave a shout out to his LGBTQ brothers and sisters. By the way, the Q, I just want everyone to know, I have a friend who was there, saw a teleprompter, the Q was not there. So that's how woke Donald Trump is. Um, it's true, I'm gonna, my next piece I'm going to write is going to be a woke Trump, how to be your, how to be your best woke self, Donald Trump. Um, but it was the most Trumpian moment, because of course, what does he do? He says how much he cares about his LGBTQ brothers and sisters, and for that reason, he vowed to protect them from a foreign and hateful ideology, which is, of course, Islam. Um, and that moment, I kind of felt like, wow, he's, he's, he's brilliant. He's a genius. I'm sorry, I really think he is. Then I kind of stupidly listened to all of our smart friends, and I'm also reconsidering the term smart and dumb, because I actually think that people who we, I mean, and this is a problem with the, I think, maybe sometimes, uh, but I'm not sure who, who's dumber, honestly, right now. Uh, the, the, the people who, who thought that it could never happen, the people who thought people would never vote for him. Um, anyway, so I think this is a really, as you said, maybe we shouldn't dwell on the shock, but I think it is a very telling moment. But um, what, what I find even more shocking than this victory is the lack of, um, and I shouldn't be shocked by this, but the lack of self-reflection among the, the I'm with her crowd. I said something I thought was kind of diplomatic on, on Facebook about how um, upset I am that we have Trump and how it was really the DNC's fault. And I had a former friend who announced he was now befriending me who worked at the DNC and he told me that I had been nasty and accusatory in my tone and he was unfriending me. And I was like, wow, you are brief. I mean, I, like, I, that's chutzpah, chutzpah, as, as, as uh, what's her name, Michelle Bachman would call it. But I couldn't believe this, that, I, like, at the tone, well, your boss was Debbie Wasserman Schultz. You should be apologizing to everyone you know for existing and not having, like, quit. So I'm a little angry, um, but I, I'm asking this because I wanted to play a round of, like put the blame on the donkey, which kind of I didn't even realize until the justice moment when I came up with that term. It's really appropriate because we're talking about the Dems. But who, who do you, if you could name 
one reason that we have Donald Trump, I'm sorry, this is so not verso and so dumbed down intellectual, but Trump is our president, so we might as well fall asleep. But if you could name one thing, it could be a thing, it could be a phenomenon, or a person, or one moment, that explains, you think, more than anything else, and I know this hardware intellectual is always a multiplicity of confluent factors. Um, but if you could do that, what would you do? What would you explain it on? So, um, I also just had no fucking clue. Um, and, uh, but I do remember specifically a moment during, I believe it was the second debate, and Hillary Clinton had been sort of waffling and she, um, she wasn't performing well. And I remember like reading through Twitter and seeing all the liberals saying like, oh, he's so vulgar and horrible. And I was like, have you been to America? We fucking love vulgar and horrible. What are you, what are you doing? Um, but then he landed on NAFTA. And I was like, fuck, I wish he was on our side. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I wish we had 10 of him. And, you know, she didn't have anything to say about it. And, and I thought back, I'm, I'm from Indiana, and Hoosiers remember NAFTA. We will never forget it. And I was just, I, I still thought, not because Hillary Clinton was a strong candidate, but because I thought the infrastructure of the Democratic Party was just so efficient that they would win, and just because Trump had no ground game or anything. It wasn't any kind of faith in, in her as a candidate, or even um, you know, a, a fear of a rising tide of fascism of his, you know, of his fans or whatever. And, and honestly, the, the voter turnout for him wasn't that high. It was that the voter turnout for Hillary Clinton was extremely low. Um, but I definitely had that moment where I was like, she has nothing to counter this with. She's not going to, she's not going to make amends for all of the legitimate criticisms that he's just Granted, he's just pulling them out of the ass, but some of them are real. NAFTA and TPP. Yeah. So I've actually um, really been a nerd out and do a more versatile moment yeah. because you asked this, but um, the original idea for doing something like this was Susan and me talking on Facebook about Maoist self-critique. And the moment of self-critique at that moment was going to be, how did we let Hillary win? So now things are a little different. So I'm not going to talk like a normal person like Donald Trump right now, because I'm going to talk like a fucking nerd. You'll see how it works. <laughs> Dear theory heads, comrades, brothers, and sisters of the professional managerial class, it's time for us to break the chains of our class identity and its pseudo-innovative protocols of political participation and talk like normal people. But before I get to the talking like a normal person from the tri-state area, which I am, even though I live in California, I'm going to talk to you very briefly in the language that we use when we want to oppress each other with our erudition, our political correctness, and our probity. In precious theory seminars around the country, often taught by cosmopolitan elites, you are able to talk a good talk about attending to the other. Levinas and all that jazz, Derrida, you like that stuff, remember? So try for a moment to figure out how the other might be speaking to you right now and just gave you, and your good intentions, the fucking finger. The forgotten people, your forgotten people spoke. They're, you're going to tell me that they are not the white working class, that the Trump voter was on the whole wealthier than the Clinton voter. For that you that the Trump voter, because of his or her marginal status in our PMC managed knowledge economy, feels herself the inheritor of working class values, the kind of values that do violate so much of what we feel are the proper codes of address when dealing with quote unquote others. A vote for Trump was a protest vote against the establishment alliance that Clintonism was trying to build between Lena Dunham and debt ridden college grads, between Katie Perry in the SEIU, between upper middle class but harried hyphenated immigrant moms like yours truly and Susan and Sheryl Sandberg, between credit card debt strapped soccer parents and Lloyd Blankfein. Those who stayed home and refused to vote in this election were also talking to you, to us. The subaltern spoke, but can we, the wounded and the well-groomed, really listen? Are we going to double down on Bill Clinton era identity politics, a politics that emerged when 
enabling free trade while promoting a highly stylized multiculturalism that was supposed to channel the political energy of the 1960s social movements into a series of institutional recruitments that did precious little to improve the lives of most Americans, the majority of Americans, people who work for a living and are paid by the hour. But what it did do, it didn't improve the lives. Free trade did not improve the lives of most Americans. It did find its finest avatar and the meritocratic idol that we call Barack Obama. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. So it's all on us, people. It's all on us. And I'm never going to use the word necropolitics, biopolitics, difference, other, privilege, ever. I, I may try to embrace you, comrades, if you try to use that shit, but I will never, ever use those words, ever, because I'm going to talk like a normal person. <laughs> It's very hard to follow that, but I'm just going to say, um, just to sort of, I guess to repeat it, I think that if there's one thing we could say, it's not a person, but it's, a, you know, the meritocracy. It's the idea that um, people, you know, they get educated, they get knowledge, technical expertise, and then, and from then on, we have, you know, perfectly uncontroversial policies and decisions that can be made. So I'm a political scientist, but I don't study American politics, but through the wonders of social media, I got you know, experts in their fields in American politics telling me daily how to understand what's going on, what voters are thinking, how we should interpret poll results, and as a result, I was blindsided because I also bought into the meritocratic claims of my fellow PhDs who told me that this was inevitable. I was told things like 320, you know, electoral college votes by 11 p.m. Um, and, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton, the, the most common argument I, f I heard from her uh, Pantsuit Nation devotees was that she's the most qualified person for presidency, but presidency isn't about qualifications. It's not a technical job in which if you have knowledge of certain, you know, uh, methods or various techniques, right, then therefore you become president, you know, everyone recognizes it, and then you become the most efficient, most technocratic, and, you know, best president ever. It's a popularity contest. It's literally do people like you, and do they want you in charge? So it's, it's the exact opposite of, of, of qualification. And, and the argument just fell flat. It fell flat with me, but it fell flat with everybody else as well. Um, I think I'm going to cheat and sure. say th two things. The first thing goes back to the first question. You know, back in the spring, um, I had this anxiety about how accurate the polling data was because I was thinking about something called the Bradley effect, which you know was found out with Tom Bradley's election in the 70s, which is that um, when people went out and were polled to ask if they were going to vote for a black candidate, uh, they said yes. But there was this huge disjuncture whenever you had black electoral candidates um, with a pre-voting polling data and then exit polling and there was this huge disjuncture and so political scientists tried to figure out what this meant and ultimately they thought that this had to do with racism. People didn't want to admit that they didn't want to vote for a black candidate on the basis of being black and I had this sense that this is very possible that it would function like this in the election. Um, I didn't write about it, I didn't think about it, I didn't focus on it because I really thought the sheer power of the Clinton machine and the kind of mobilization of the Democratic National Convention and the, um, just the force of how truly awful Donald Trump is. So um, I didn't take that as seriously, but I do think that helps to explain some of the, you know, the quantitative surprise about how this happened. I do think there was an element of the Bradley effect. Um, the conservative neoliberal politics of Hillary Clinton played a very important role in this, but I also think that Trump's victory reflects l larger problems and structural problems inside the United States. And I think the scale of racism and the kind of, you know, the statistics about white downward mobility and given the size of that nevertheless, partially because of voter disfranchisement, but that how overwhelmingly white the electorate is, that the 
the racial politics of Trump matter a great deal. And I, um, while being quite dissatisfied with Hillary Clinton, I did not support her. I wrote about her very critically. I wrote about the legacy of the war on crime and the war on drugs and the role of the Democrats in building the mass edifice of, of mass incarceration. So I take that very seriously. But I think also a broader discussion about Trump and the ways in which that he was able to mobilize the anxieties of rapid downward mobility, but to deeply racialize that. And I think that matters a great deal and how that played itself out in race and gender politics. Can you explain uh, a little bit on what you mean by his ability to racialize that? Um, can, I give a, can I give an example? I actually wrote something very personal about this and I've been thinking about it. I was up until 2.30 a.m. watching the election and it, I, it turns out I'm from Erie, I'm from Erie County. So I was watching as John King was breaking down the, the, the state of Erie, uh, breaking down Erie County in the state of Pennsylvania. And um, in 2008, uh, Erie, Erie went for Obama. But historically, Erie is an hour from Buffalo. It is the heart of what people call the Reagan Democrats today would be Trump land. And it is a place, 95% white, 5% black population, once upon a time, unionized workforce, you know, heavily white ethnic, Sicilian, Ukrainian, uh, Polish. Um, but, you know, underwent really rapid deindustrialization, lost its industry in the 70s and 80s, heavy dirty industry, foundries, castings, paper, hammer mill, GE. But this part of the country was deeply, deeply racist and deeply pro-Reagan and the ways in which they understood their own economic downward mobility was deeply racialized. There was an immense amount of anti-Asian sentiment because of the anger at the auto industry, at the Japanese auto industry. And I really had a sense going up there, I mean, you know, these were my neighbors, these are the people that I lived around, that you know, I understood it as um, people in many ways disinherited their children because of their anxiety of black populations and others getting AFDC, that they hated the welfare state, there was a strong hating the welfare state, hating immigrants, racializing their understanding of their own sense of economic crisis. And I think that that does matter. This larger question about the racial politics of why Trump is elected is not limited to white working class people. It's broader than that. We know that, right? The overwhelming majority of the white population voted for Trump. Even among white college educated women, only 6% went for Hillary. So this is a much larger question. I don't want to reify working class voters and say that they are the only part of the Trump base, but they are the largest percentage of the electorate. And in the swing states like Pennsylvania, I think that those kinds of politics matter a lot. And I think that needs to be talked about as well. And it was precisely Hillary Clinton's, you know, the primary campaign with Bernie Sanders, the strong articulation and demand of a redistributive state, the promise of a, prom of a future for our children, the repudiation of that uh, with um, really the crushing of the Sanders campaign, which I, I do feel happened. Um, that helped to pave the way for this, but I guess I would like to have a dialogue about both the shortcomings of the Clinton campaign and really thinking of Hillary Clinton's campaign as the bitter fruit of the Democratic Leadership Council. You know, the Democratic Leadership Council was disbanded in 2014, but this campaign took its playbook still straight from the DLC in many ways, and we've seen how it's turned out. Yeah. Um, wow, well, well said. Um, Megan, do you want to address this? Yeah, or I have, so I have a question tailored to you, so it's up to you. Okay. Um, well, I'll just say quickly, I was shocked um, by the victory, but less because I thought Hillary was a good candidate. I thought she was a horrible candidate. Um, and, and more because I was surprised by the fact that um, I don't want to say corporate overlords, but our, but Wall Street, like where were they? They were so disorganized. Um, so it was almost like the democracy um, of, of the vote shocked me. I, I did not expect it to go that way in that sense. And you, as someone who writes about teaching and teachers and the role of Hillary Clinton in um, Arkansas especially, um, her kind of how on um, feminist her, she, she has been over the years, and you look a lot at her policy. Do you, what does that give us a window into in terms of her, her kind of both her failures, but also the way she's perceived? Do you think? 
can you sure yeah so I, I guess I just I you're such an expert on teaching and education and the, on what she, and her role in Arkansas so I guess I was um, wondering how much you think that gives us a window into the disconnect between how she presents herself I mean in, in other words in Arkansas from when I read your chapter right she dismantled so many of the programs that she claims to defend right right so I was just wondering I guess whether you have the sense among teachers like your colleagues or people who write about this what how much they kind of saw through her well, I think, um, I mean, the whole slogan, I'm with her, she's running on her identity, but it's an identity that not a lot of women um, can can respond to, can, can affirm. Um, and I don't think voting for a woman in this case was an affirmation of their identity for most people. I think people are rational, and they do tend to vote for their economic interests. Um, and I think... Uh, Teachers, middle class people, working class people, women didn't see themselves in her, and that, that was her whole pitch. It just occurred to me the other day how, how terrible and what a self-parody it was for the slogan to be, one of her slogans to be, I'm with her. I mean, it literally is like every single thing that she's hated for, which is like the personalized uh, inner circle, like making it about her identity, making it a loyalty issue. I mean, why would anyone, why would that work on anyone who's not already with her, right? It's like, wow, I as a Bernie bro could have run a way better campaign for Hillary Clinton. And I, right, I've said that from the beginning. Me too. fucking this up. I know. Take over. Or let me. Let me, I don't know why. I know. I did that. I offered. I kept offering webinars on Twitter. I was like, I will give you free webinars how to be a better shell, how to be a better liar. They're just bad liars. No, no, no. I actually had a serious thing on Facebook where I was like, here, if Hillary apologized and I gave her the apology list, I would be really happy for her. And I was like, here, free, free speech. Right. I'm sorry for being for taking Goldman Sachs money. I'm sorry for lying to you about free trade. I'm sorry for being a hawkish imperialist. I'm sorry for wearing jewel-colored pantsuits and making you think that that's like some kind of female solidarity. I'm sorry for faking solidarity. I'm sorry for putting down a socialist. I was like, I think a lot of young people would have come out for you, babe, if you were right. like, taking right. my apology out. I was saying this earlier to Catherine, but you know, the whole I'm with her thing, and again, this ties into the whole her of her qualifications, Okay, so for most of the women in this country, she reminds you of your female boss. And who doesn't love their female boss? I mean, I, I had a friend say to me, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's like, uh, um, and she writes about black feminist issues, and she was like, yeah, everyone knows that. Female bosses are the worst bosses, and black cops are the worst cops. Like, obviously, we've all had a horrible experience with a female boss who's like, we're friends, right? We're friends. No, no one likes you. No one likes you. You're terrible. You represent something that repulses people on a primitive level, especially working class women. You're a fundamentally unlikable person. <laughs> Not to mention, not to mention that the only rhetorical parallel people are used to that goes alongside I'm with anyone is I'm with stupid. That's yeah. the only... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Like, didn't it's true. someone point, didn't some 18-year-old fucking young, dumb, full of cum person just say, like, Hillary, have you seen those t-shirts? They say I'm with stupid. She probably hasn't seen them, in all fairness, though. She probably hasn't. And but they were like, we got nothing else. We're going yeah. with it. Where is James Carville, though? Where is James Carville? But Donna, I saw your, fa I saw the wheels in your head turning as Amber was talking, so I would love to hear what you, I don't know. I have a, I have a, I, maybe a different point of emphasis. I mean, not to say something obvious, but you know, no Democrat, no Democratic candidate has won the majority of the white vote since 1964, right? White women supported, they supported Trump, but white women have supported Republicans since 1964. I, I, I want to be careful about personalizing. I think there are many failures of Clinton's campaign, but some of the racial politics, how do you interpret 
the, these, these complex intersections of political identity. And, and this election, I think they're complicated. I think uh, one could argue that race trumped gender. White women voted, black women voted for Hillary 94%, right? Latinas voted for Hillary 69%. Uh, and white women voted for, let's see, I, I had all the, the numbers memorized. They voted for Trump at the rate, was it 53%, right? Yeah, all white women and then college educated, college educated, educated women for Clinton, 6%. But the total white female vote for, for Trump was 53%. So if we disaggregate this by race, we have a much more complicated story than a, an essential female subjectivity. Um, so I think that some of that, some of that analysis needs to be done. I myself have a very kind of melancholy relationship about you know the language that was used about black women in particular as Hillary's firewall you know just the choice of that term firewall the idea that that they would absorb you know all of the opposition given Hillary's own implication in in mass incarceration and the use of the term super predator and not only as a historical artifact you know it, I believe it was in the Michigan election in the Michigan debate when she was asked about her comment about super predators and she said oh I meant Mexican cartels. I was I was talking about me protecting the country from Mexican cartels. So some of the when we're talking about racism, I think that the Clinton, while there was such an amazing leveraging of blacks' political support. I mean, watching the Democratic National Convention, there were many more black people in in this year's Democratic National Convention than there were in both of Obama's conventions. You know, she saw the black community as an absolutely essential and core constituent. But nevertheless, there are very selective moments where she did mobilize racist rhetoric, and that response about Mexican cartels as, as super predators to me was just one of the absolute low points. But I, want, I want to just press you a little bit about how race trumps gender. I don't quite follow your argument, Donna. And one of the things that I'm thinking too is that when we talk about anti racism, etc., and um, um, the configuration of the Democratic Party, it seems like the Democratic Party decided that it it wasn't anti, that it was anti-racist because it had promoted um, black, the black bourgeoisie to positions of power. And so that spectacle of anti-racism is something that didn't work for me. The Democratic Party is not really anti-racist, as I think we're all arguing, but I don't really understand what your argument is here about depersonalizing it and making it structural racism. Are you just saying, like, Donald Trump voters are just racist and that's it? I, I really don't understand what you're getting at here. What I'm saying is that if you look at, at, if you look at this as a form of partisan politics, no, no president has been elected with the majority of the white vote since 1964. No Democrat has been elected with a majority of the white vote since 1964. I'm saying that that matters, that understanding the racial politics of this matter a great deal. That's why I'm emphasizing the different responses of different groups of women to Hillary Clinton. Not to defend Hillary Clinton, I certainly have written about her critically, but I think that white women vote Republican, and that's not unique to this election. That was true for Mitt Romney. In fact, they voted for Mitt Romney in larger numbers than they did for Hillary Clinton. So it's a, you know, trying to understand the intersectional relationships, they matter, right? They're different groups of women. White people were supporting Trump. Trump was supported by the white population, male, female, cross class. It did happen. That's what I mean. And that's not a new phenomenon in this election. All right, so then, I, do, you th do you, I'm sorry, um, do you think then it was just, dilu it was diluted to run a campaign to some effect, to some extent, uh, based on, on the fact she was a woman, because uh, clearly a, a decent percentage of women weren't going to vote for her based on that uh, fact. I mean, I think we also have to remember, though, that Hillary lost states that Obama won, 
Mm -hmm. I mean, she was a worse candidate. And some of that, that could go either way, too. That could be, you could argue that, like, you know, racist, I mean, not either, either, because they're not mutually exclusive. But either racist sentiments are, uh, you know, expanding and becoming more pervasive or, you know, crystallizing in some way. But you could also say that, you know, the white working class has become more disaffected after eight years of a neoliberal president. I don't think it's either or, but I also think we can't de-emphasize the fact that, I mean, people don't have faith in the Democrats. The working class does not have faith in the Democrats. Some of that was, I think, because Hillary was it's just, no one likes her. I mean, like, you, I, I don't think you can discount the personal in this. I think elections are, to some degree, a popularity contest. Um, but, I mean, I, it, it's, it's hard to separate those two things because it's not as if they're disparate. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like, you know, Indiana went, went for Obama. Indiana went for Trump. A bunch of uh, Trump campaign appearances, went, spent hours and hours on YouTube watching them. And he said uh, Trump would talk about the wall and, you know, Muslims. But then he'd quickly move. Most of what he would talk about was trade, um, job loss, um, and he would go on, like, you know, 80% of what he talked about was these kinds of issues, which Hillary is very weak on and which she really never addressed. Trade, job loss, uh, corruption, you know, the, the stink pot of the Clinton Foundation, you know, all that sort of stuff. And he said none of this stuff really ever made it into the mainstream news coverage of the Trump campaign. But this is what people who went to his rallies heard. So, the, you know, the, the deplorables got a very different view of Trump than the people uh, in the elite, you know, metropolitan centers did. I, I want to push back a little bit just on this narrative of the white working class. I grew up in New Hampshire. And if you've ever been to New Hampshire, you know this is one hick-ass state. I mean, this is not... Dartmouth, you know, it's like it's, they have no income tax, they have no sales tax, they have the second lowest education budget after Mississippi. So they voted Clinton and Democrat down ticket. They voted out Kelly Ayotte. They voted. I only say this because I think it needs to be in there somewhere. A lot of people on the muscular left on Facebook kept saying. <laughs> saying like it's the white working class I think we need to start thinking about a striation of what that means it doesn't mean the same thing there's almost no minorities in New Hampshire it's not some uh, cosmopolitan state it's not Vermont like this New Yorkers don't go there for the summer so uh, so Mitt Romney lives there um, so I, I think that it's it's an interesting fact when I watch the you know, elections like everyone else, and everyone's like, oh, New Hampshire, come on. And, you know, there's a tiny percentage, but my socialist friend got a, 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 a voted into the state rep. So it's, it, I think it's, it's interesting, and I, I don't know, Amber, I mean, you're from Indiana. I don't know where everyone else here is from. A lot of people in the audience are probably from rural places. I think during the Q&A, it might be really interesting for us to try to think about, like, how do we get our heads around the complexities of that question and also not romanticize this, you know, voter out in the middle of nowhere thinking Donald Trump is going to, like, make his abandoned Walmart into a widget factory where he'll work. Like, I don't know that that's a real thing. Um, I want to talk about and ask you guys about the role of identity politics and what that means kind of on, on the ground, not just among academics or in the academy and on Twitter, where I think... Um, I think the idea, oh, Twitter's not real life. Of course Twitter's not real life, right? But it represents something. It represents some kind of discussion. And I think it represents a kind of thinking that maybe does trickle down into campaigning um, or into uh, policy or into uh, programs, right? So um, the other day I saw a tweet... I was looking for tweets of people saying to people whose votes they needed for Clinton to win, more or less, go fuck yourself. And um, I was asking for examples of that on Twitter. And one of the examples was someone who said they are learning that, the, that they don't matter, especially white men. They're demographically irrelevant. Hashtag put me in progressive prison. 
Okay, that was a tweet. Does that make sense at all? Or am I being, so someone, okay, I mean, I know it doesn't make sense, but you get what the sentiment was, right? Okay, okay, good, yeah. So I responded, I said, ha nothing, I just responded and said, hashtag put Donald Trump in the White House. And someone whose name rhymes with Mady Foyle um, <laughs> tweeted about, she unblocked me for five seconds, um, which is really a kind of radical act um, and disrupts the power structure and um, told me how racist I was because I was, the woman who tweeted this was um, Amani Gandhi. She's the woman who tweeted the put me in progressive jail. And um, so Sadie had to um, put on her white savior cape and tell me that, um, are you, asked me, are you really blaming a black woman for putting a white supremacist in the White House? Um, which I wasn't, because I don't think one person has the power to put Donald Trump in the White House, obviously. But I thought that that was kind of an amazing crystallization of, that to me was like Hillary Clinton's campaign in a way. It's like, or it was, it was received this way, like, it is, it is unwoke to pretend that white men matter. And so we're not going to try to appeal to these people. And if I, even saying that right now, I feel like someone's gonna be like, oh, so that's what, really? She was supposed to answer to white men? But I mean, they, they live here. And this is not, I'm not asking to throw them a pity party, but I wanna know about identity politics and the disconnect between the way we would like to be able to run campaigns and the way we really actually have to win campaigns or run campaigns. And when I say we, that sounds like I was with Hillary. So forget that. Okay. I think it's clear that I mean, and this is not directly due to the Trump campaign, but it was certainly invigorated by it, but, you know, those white men are forming their own identity politics. I mean, if you look at the sort of, like, nationalism that's developing now, that is their identity politics. Uh, they, in the absence of a kind of egalitarian uh, kind of politics and with the sort of, I don't know, a, a, liberal media dominance of a very specific and I think sort of shallow kind of identity politics. A sort of like... Which is every identity well, of class. No, right? Because right. class and isn't allowed to be... That a racist class... It's an immaterial yeah. identity yeah. politics. Right. It's an anti-materialist right. identity no, politics. No, if you think about gen uh, transgender people, queer people, women, working class transgender people have it the worst, have it terribly. LGBTQ people in the working class are so fucked in so many different ways, but we see celebrate like Caitlyn Jenner and like really rich queer people and everyone in cosmopolitan cities like making cafe, ca cafe lattes, whatever people drink. Being served. No, right, no, this is on the every single level of identity, the level of class that is not talked about is incredible. So Asian Americans, we're all meritocratic, we're all like strivers. Who gets invisibilized in this? Working class Asian Americans. And there are plenty of them go to Chinatown, you know? So so the thing is that you can have identity politics if you put class first. And if you say that, you're like a brony bro, which is insane, which is totally insane. And I'm sorry, we have to fight back on racism, but not engage in neoliberal anti-racism, just as we cannot engage in neoliberal feminism. And what is neoliberal anti-racism? It's when the chancellor of my university is like, oh, we have so many diverse people at this university. This this is great. In the meantime, he's suppressing all of these. He's totally undemocratic. He's just raising money from like rich people in Orange County. So you've got to look at how this language has been assimilated by the kinds of democratic power elites that run the UC system, for instance. And so we've got diversity issues for everything. And what do they call class diversity? It's some weird term that you don't even recognize. And I'm sorry. I, I am done with this. I am so done with this. Let us be done with this and talk about working class people of all different races, sexual preferences, and, uh, and abilities. I think it's so telling that Paul Krugman, sorry to mention, trigger warning, Paul Krugman um, wrote a piece indicting Bernie Sanders for appealing to white angry men because God knows that Hillary was going to be be like that's that's Hillary's job, right? The idea and and it's 
It's like the, the liberal media and liberals in general are so out of touch that they see a strength as a liability, right? You want someone to speak to people who need to come out and vote. And it's this identity politics that makes it uncool to resonate among white working class men and so what, what happens? Okay, yeah, we're not going to talk about class, right? Because that's not an identity politics. So what happens? What do they have to rally around? Donald Trump stuff, right? So obviously, it's, if there's not a class discussion, then what is it? It's going to be nationalism and xenophobia and racism. It's like such a no-brainer. So anyway, I, I still want, um, like, I know we have to push back and make the, make Donald Trump as a, uh, as a, as tr as un Mike Pence like as possible. Forget Trump. I'm not even that scared of him, honestly. Like I think that he he if he if he had his druthers, I think he would rule like he would kind of like a Bloom like a Michael Bloomberg type, um, which isn't as scary, honestly, as other presidents we've had. Mike Pence scares the shit out of me, though. Um, and. But what are we going to do about kind of the, the media? Like, don't we need them to, to do a big mea culpa and then retire? Like, I don't want, why are these people still writing the stories and telling us what happened? It's like, hi, we got everything wrong, so now we're going to tell you why we got everything wrong and none of it's our fault. Okay, that was not a question, that was venting. Um, but at least I own that. That's the difference between me and Paul Krugman, right? <laughs> Paul Krugman just does psychoanalysis on, all, on himself and we have to read it and think it's policy analysis. Okay, so whoever wants to jump in there, yeah. Position with this, um, with this question of identity politics right now because I'm embroiled in a stupid controversy that doesn't even matter here, but I think what's really complicating, and I don't know Catherine and other people at universities, is right now universities are embroiled in these bizarre debates about trigger warnings and safe spaces and who's the, the kind of who needs what. And it's very hard. It's actually very hard. It's not funny or stupid. It's like hard work to think through it. But I have a white male middle-aged colleague who decided he wanted to critique safe spaces <laughs> I'm not making it up. But he was so afraid of social justice warriors, he had to hide on the alt-right Trump Twitter uh, thing. Um, so he wanted a safe space to critique safe spaces, because he was afraid of me and other people coming after him. Like, when you're there, I feel like I'm out of my own mind. Like, I don't understand where we are in the discourse at this point to try to talk about identity politics in a meaningful way. And I think you're right. It hasn't been since the 80s for me that intersectionality and class politics have suddenly become so hostile toward each other and so complicated. I mean, as educators, I think it's a really interesting question, but I also think it's, it's proven to be a non-rich and non-productive um, kind of place of thought where I used to think it was actually interesting and dynamic. I don't know what how that's come to be. Susan uh, I just want to say uh, that uh, Jody Dean, my interviewed her the other day, said she lives in upstate New York, uh, near G in Geneva. Uh, but she said, you know, the area around there is intensely poor. They're, like they, they, the the roofs are taped on with duct tape. I'm, I'm not kidding. Um, and she saw a sign in the lawn uh, around there that said, "Deplorable lives matter." Now that phrase would, of course, get some people boiled in oil for saying that because uh, you know it was an appropriation and inappropriate and all. But these are people who are incredibly poor and incredibly despised and you know, voting for Trump was a way to say fuck you and um, we really need to understand that too so we're going to you know, talk about identity. This is an identity that's extremely disparaged and marginalized by all you know, the right thinking people uh, and um, it's a very serious problem and we can see you asked earlier what was the moment you know, that crystallized everything it's like when, one, of the, one of them was certainly when Hillary used that word deplorables uh, and we now have Democrats experience explaining her loss by, you know, just really hammering the deplorable message even more. And this is exactly the wrong thing to do. You know, certainly there may be very many uh, uncivilized and, you know, backward attitudes among the deplorable population, but it's a very large part of the American population. And unless we get that all sorted out, we're just going to have, uh, you know, these sorts of problems. You know, getting out of the, the neoliberal versus the reactionary, uh, um, you know, we, we need a third choice. And as long as we're stuck on this, you know, that's what, that's what Sanders represented, getting out of that, that, that un, unpleasant binary, but uh, that was all crushed. Um, but, you know, this, these deplorables have some problems. Yeah. Um, 
I just want to say that uh, amongst the people that I know professionally who write about elections and talk about like they're doing the post-mortem right now, there's a real um, push to blame everything on racism or sexism, and which is of course present, but to say that there's no legitimate grievances that folks could have who might vote for Trump, particularly those who might have come out and voted twice for Obama. And in doing so, they, they're absolving uh, this professional managerial class as well as future Democratic campaigns from engaging with what might be the economic grievances that people have living in these forgotten areas. And um, I think that that's, good. that's a dominant narrative I see in the news media. I mean, it's one that you know Doug just mentioned had happened before the election, and it's something that we have to fight back against because you know universal programs without means testing are things that can unite right this professional managerial class as well as um, I guess the deplorables. Um, and that's something that I, I keep I've been I've been fighting about it on social media. I don't know if productively or not for long for a while now as a result. But it, it, it remains. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues who's in professional public management said, "Why should the Democrats have to cater to racists?" Like that's, that's sort of that's a dominant. Yeah, that's a, do a dominant narrative that's emerged. Yeah, that's right. The and, and they don't deserve to actually suffer all the time. Which the thing that drives me crazy is like there are two issues. One is the moral and ethical like issue. Like, do these people deserve to be catered to? Blah blah blah. But that's kind of a moot point because, like it or not, like they vote. So if you actually care about winning an election, I just find it so academic and precious and privileged. The idea that we're like, I don't need to talk to these people because, do, like, do you think? people really thought the, the, these people didn't matter, weren't going to vote? Or do you think they just, they thought they had it in the bag? But they thought, I think they thought they weren't going to vote. I mean, the thing I'd point out is that we're also all arguing over a shrinking pie. And that's part of the anger, too, is, you know, incomes are still down from 2000. Um, much was made by the Clinton campaign about the um, income gains last from last year, which were fairly decent for 2015. But regardless, that still leaves the vast majority of the population way behind where they probably think they should be or um, were um, compared to somebody 20 years ago. Um, so you can't forget that part of the anger either. There's also still a foreclosure crisis. Um, there's still several hundred thousand homes a year being foreclosed upon. Nobody talks about this. Um, and so I think you know you, this is all meshed into this identity thing. And when I think you hear identity, I think a certain percentage of people say, well, what about me? Which is not to say they're right or wrong, but to say that this is a human reaction, um, and to, some, to expect somebody who's you know unemployed in you know Indiana steel town to go oh but so and so had it worse is to expect people to not be human beings, and I think one of the things the left has always had something of an issue of is that we tend to expect people not to be human beings. We want to improve people, and this makes us wonderful and admirable. It also makes us beyond unrealistic about what we're dealing with a lot of the time. There, there's also a lot of privilege in that, right? In that. Like, sorry, and then I'll... Yeah. And I want to address the media thing, too, but oh, go okay. ahead first. Well, just the irony is that, again, like, it's not whether or not you want to... The people who suffer when we don't take people into account, who we dismiss as racist, aren't just, like, white... They're the very people who anti-racist care about or, or belong to, right? Like, that won't fix racism, so you just have more racism. Right. Like, I don't get why people don't see it as not good for... I mean, I, my feeling is, is, as somebody who grew up in South Brooklyn before the Great Gentrification, you know, they, they were racist back when, too. The question is, is why do they act on it sometimes and not others? Because I, I guess I would like to change people. Um, I would hope that the more progress you make, you change people. But at a certain point, you live in the here and now, and you also just have to get people to not act on really repulsive impulses, too. Okay, so I, I just want to say two, a couple things. If we're real materialists and we should care about the numbers, the, large, the, the greater proportion of poor and working class people in America are still white. And within the black population, economic polarization is accelerating at the same rate that it is in, within the rest of the population. So black elites are doing much better than black working class people. And so those are forces that are tearing the society apart. Now we're going to go to identity politics, not talk about class, at our own peril. Because nobody else is going to talk about that. Because this country hates socialism too. But it d doesn't have to. Because you saw what happened with Bernie Sanders. Right. And I, there's one thing I do... 
I just want to address the media thing for a minute because I think the media is getting a lot of blame, um, some of which is deserved. But the media is not a monolith and the media is in deep, desperate trouble. And I think this is two things that really need to be pointed out. Um, TV has always had wretched coverage of campaigns probably since the day Walter Cronkite went off the air. Um, this is not exactly new um, that you know the cable news channels are not particularly covering campaigns very well. Um, so to suddenly blame them for doing a bad job is, you know, they had, didn't do a bad job. They've always been doing a bad job. Um, newspapers um, are barely paying the bills at this point. That the, you know, the fact is, is the New York Times, and the Washington Post, and the LA Times, and the Wall Street Journal were actually doing some really fantastic work. Um, for the Hillary campaign. No, also for both. I mean, Washington Post was all over Donald Trump's um, charity, uh, quote charity, we should say, um, which uh, the main beneficiary of which appeared to be one Donald J. Trump, um, including spending, I believe, $20,000 on a painting of himself. Um, oh, you know, that's not Moxie. Yeah. Yeah. But, right, but the point is, is they were investigating it. It was out there. I didn't um, think they were so vicious. I mean, they were so viciously anti-Sanders and so up their own asses. Well, I think the third Hillary Clinton. part is, is there are not a lot of resources. And I think that's something people generally don't realize unless they're in the business themselves. The level of resources that are devoted to the are, you know, you can't keep up with where it was 10 or 15 years ago because the papers were laying off. The Wall Street Journal was laying people off before the election. Um, the, this is a huge part of the issue. The, the resources are simply not there. And that's part of also the fake news issue. It's not just that this fake news is coming out of, you know, being dumped up on Facebook. It's also that it's filling a gap in the system. But Rachel Maddow did, and then I'm going to turn to you, but Rachel Maddow did, her major takeaway so far were that uh, third parties cost Hillary Clinton the vote and her big um, like correction because she loves she's a civics geek oh my god if I have to hear her say that again uh, okay. okay her main correction was that actually um, George Bush passed NAFTA not Bill Clinton so I mean that stuff is not a resources issue I wish it were she's a Rhodes Scholar and she knows that she's right, lying the majority of the media is not repeating the third party line because it's clearly a math issue I mean obviously most of the people who were voting for Gary Johnson had they not probably would have voted but for Donald Trump, Trump. Right. I, mean, I, don't, no was, I, don't, I don't think most people hear that on right. Well, I mean, you're talking about the New York Times, you're talking about the Wall Street Journal, but the fact is we completely underestimated the middle of the country because we don't have, like, the Indianapolis Star and the Milwaukee Tribune and shit like that. Those, that those are gone now. It is, or yeah. almost gone, I should say. Yeah, uh, but the fact, like, I think, honestly, we would have been able to predict this, or at least there would have been more predictions, if there was more local news, because it has literally been, like, these few, like, coastal legacy publications being like, well, I drove through an Applebee's and, you know, Duluth, and, like, I think they're all going to be fine. Um, uh, but, but more, you know, back to what we were sort of talking about earlier, um, but I, I think, and I don't have this completely thought out in my head, so forgive me if it's still this kind of amorphous thing, but I think it's fascinating that the Clinton campaign defended uh, their pandering um, and and their their uh, technique and their methods of campaigning by saying like should we have to pander to racists to the white working class oh you care about racists you care about and no one came back and said and this is incredibly unpopular but yeah I, I do care about racists I do, I do care about misogynists I, I don't want them to starve I do want them to have health care I also have found that historically if someone's like a little racist and then they lose their job, they get a lot more racist. So the idea that they're, um, they push through this kind of, I think it's a neoliberal psychological affliction of a moral means testing, of you have to be deserving of a welfare state. And I'm, I'm talking about in terms of the campaign, but it's, it's, it's an ideological thing that has saturated us. And it's like, who is deserving enough of communism? Well, we're not. Human beings don't deserve full communism, but we 
need it and we have to get it, so it doesn't matter. Sure, we may not have, we may have to call something else. <laughs> I have to say this with the, my uncle's CPUSA, but um, <laughs> Lifetime Achievement Award winner. Um, I'll have you know. But um, I just, I think that in terms of the media though, and I, I'm, I am a little bit obsessed with this, but I do think that they really created Hillary instead of Sanders. Like I really think that this is an issue and of course, like the, of course the, the New York Times and the Post, um, they're elite uh, liberal publications, but I, I, I think that like they may, played a huge role in getting, uh, making Hillary the, the nominee instead of Sanders. And of course I think Sanders would have, would have beaten Trump because he would have actually been able to speak and be heard because like it or not, like he is, uh, you know, I, I heard Nina Turner say this today on MSNBC, like Trump spoke to people's economic suffering and he listened to people, right? Maybe he's uh, like not the, I don't think he's the best person in the world. I don't know if he's, but he's an active listener, right? If we want to use academic language, I mean, I'm kind of joking, but Hillary didn't sound like she knew what was going on with people. And um, the other thing is that, I just forgot what I was going to say, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's something really risky and it's going to be on tape, but I really want to um, test the waters here and I haven't thought this through, but I'm going to talk like a normal person. I, I was thinking, why don't we start a new kind of politics where we figure out that baseline, everyone is a racist and it's only degrees of racism and we can't, we reject the PMC's protocols of talking about race as being non-racist because if you think about all immigrants and you think, oh, people of color, they're so, they're such noble victims, it's not true. It's just not true. My parents are very racist. My grandmother, who I love, who's dead five, eight years ago, is a terrible racist. Did she deserve um, good health care where she died in Taiwan? Yes, she did. Um, if she, did she, would she perform well in a post-colonial seminar? No, she wouldn't. No, she wouldn't. And yet she, was, she lived in countries that were colonialized so many different times. So I'm just putting it out there, guys. Let's try this. For, and maybe it'll be a horrible disaster. <laughs> Is it mic working? No. I just, I find this conversation really strange. You know, I just do, I can't lie. Um, that we're kind of moving towards arguing about, um, you know, racism as the basis for the participation in the welfare state. I just, I feel like I'm in some alternate universe. I, uh, I'd like to have us be able to talk about how race and class intersect with one another. I really think that's the kind of discussion that needs to happen. And clearly, different groups are polarized by class, but we also, of course, have the political economy of race with a great deal of distribution of wealth in different groups in relationship to each other. And so I'm not, I'm, you know, Donald Trump has won the presidency the racial politics of this to me is extremely important. It is situated within anxieties about the demographic transformation of the United States. There are a whole series of things nested within this. And I'm really uncomfortable about one, um, using the white working class, even though we're saying we're not doing it, not as the representative working class, because of course we know our average Trump voter made $71,000 a year, first of all. Um, but I just I don't feel like it's the right question to be asking. I, I'll just, you know, um, I'll, I'll step back from that. Yes, we have class polarization in the African American community, but for reasons that have to do with structural racism, the black middle class is shrinking very rapidly. This is a period of a real, the Voting Rights Act has been torn apart, and we're seeing rapid downward mobility. Of course, we have radical differences between different groups of Americans, right? Different access among Asian Americans and African Americans. It's very different. What is their relationship? to whiteness, it's very different. I'd like to have a grounded discussion about that. Uh, let me say this then. You know, the, the, dem the polarization within the Asian American community is very different from what's happening within the bl black community. But the white middle class is also collapsing. And some of the, um, and the trend lines resemble between African Americans and white Americans each other more than they do with Asian Americans. And people are wondering why that is happening. And I think it has to do with immigration. And I don't know. I, I don't know how to speculate on that. But I'm sorry that you find this disturbing. I really do want to disturb the way that we've talked about race. And, I must, and I'm sorry that it doesn't fit into a model of intersectionality that um, other people have talked about. I don't, I, other, I, I am like extremely old school on this. And I'm willing to bear all the responsibility for it. And you can call me a racist. I don't care at this point. I'm really trying to test the waters now about trying to talk about politics in a different way. And I'm sorry to do it in front of so many people. It seems really risky, but I'm, you know, whatever, whatever, I don't, all, all bets are up in the air right now for me. Yes, please. Welcome. Yeah.
yeah, I don't want to seem like I'm like. Does anyone want to respond to that? Because I do want to open up to Q and A. But I think like. One thing I will say is I do think it's an important issue because there's really no group that was more impacted by the foreclosure crisis than the African Americans. The destruction of wealth among the African American community is extraordinary. And it, it, an interesting question could be, you know, why, why? Not that they have an option really of elsewhere, but the lo loyalty of the Democratic Party is really extraordinary within those circumstances. And I do think one of the things that does go on in this country, sad to say, is that there's also been quite a destruction of wealth among the you know, white working class community, though certainly not to the extent of the black working class or middle class community. And the damage of slavery in this country is that to this day, they can then go, but, but that guy's still lesser than me. And I think that is you then turned around and used by people like Donald Trump, who is clearly something of a racist. So I'm not, can I just inter I'm not. interject here? And I don't think that talking about anti-racism in some way lessens a discussion of class. Of no. course it doesn't. And the two don't have to be talked no. about okay. in that way. No, and so in talking, if I could just finish, um, in talking about some of these questions about the political economy of race, yes, of course there's class polarization among African Americans. I know in Los Angeles it's higher than it is among white Americans, but I do think disaggregating discussions of class from white anxieties about downward mobility is a separate question, and I want to talk about those as different things, because some of these have to do with questions of, you know, that many of the structures that sustain the, the white male breadwinner ideal have fallen apart. We're watching, in many ways, a white population that's downwardly mobile, that's coming more to resemble populations of color, and there's a lot of anger about that. Now, that is about class, but that is also about a history of a heron folk democracy in which whiteness has been understood as a form of economic access, and that matters. So I just really want to disaggregate these two things. I don't think in order to talk about questions of political economy, of, of class, that we have to start somehow defining that against identity politics or intersectionality. I I think that's a very unfortunate form of politics. I don't think black feminism is our enemy here for talking about class. No, I think that just to, to maybe clarify where, where my frustration is coming from with identity politics, it's not identity politics per se, it's the identity politics that is used to, to not talk about class issues, including class issues that intersect with race issues, right? So I think that, um, I mean, I guess I would ask you also, what, what, what's the takeaway from that analysis? I, I'm not challenging the way you're, you're looking at it, right? But so, okay, if, if we do look at it that way, what is, how does that apply to the real world, just like um, any of the other views would apply to the real world? Does that, in other words, how does that inform what we do now? Go ahead, you answer my question. Well, do you want to? Well, I wanted to talk earlier, and I do want to get a chance to say. Yeah, no, but that's all right. I don't have to say anything. No, I want. I just want to. I want to. You can you. I don't. I not want to put you on the spot. Not, if, you're if you're ready, if you have something. Just more broadly, you know, there's such a, a rich, important debate going on right now about racial capitalism. I would like to talk about that. I think you know there are multiple things. I think Trump has just been elected. We're also all of us were involved in a real critical dialogue about Hillary Clinton, our frustration about the narrow nature of the Democratic Party, the utter capture by finance, um, post-Citizens United, the limitations inside the Democratic Party, the legacy of the Democratic Leadership Council, and the particular culpability of the Clintons that you know Doug Henwood has written about so brilliantly. But I would like to have this situated in a broader way to talk about racial capitalism so that we can simultaneously talk about what the election of Trump means without feeling as if we have to define that against using both race and gender and the political economy of race and gender as the thing that's preventing us from talking about that. So, so, so one of the things that I would like to talk about then is like anti-racist policies in terms of um, real estate speculation or financialization. And with feminism, I think that one of the things that feminist identity politics and bourgeois feminism has focused on is sort of representation rather than policy. And Amber and I have talked about this a lot, which has to do with um, policies that will help women, like universal health care, and putting those kinds of policies front and center. 
And yes, those are all economic policies. Yeah, so in the, end, in the fight against, in the intersectional discussions, I'd like to think about like the ways in which the black uh, middle class was undermined by um, mortgage, uh, the mortgage collapse and by um, redlining and by school segregate, de facto school segregation. It's that in all of these issues, I feel like we need to put economic policy front and center and those racist, sexist seg uh, economic policies that have divested populations of sovereignty, of a universal sense of self-determination that we can all identify with. So I don't think that it's about not talking about race and class and talking about economics, but pivoting on the race and class issues by front and centering economic issues. And I think we can agree on that. I think maybe this is partly my fault for throwing out identity politics, which is such an amorphous term. I get, because um, I don't actually, not to, and this, I'm not just being like kumbaya -ish, I don't actually think that you guys disagree that much, um, because it seems like the issues, there are intersections, right? I think that some of the frustration that, I mean, it's because identity politics, let's say Clinton style, DL, DNC or DLC-ish, right? Identity politics, like, I think those kinds of identity politics were able to cover up all the shit that's wrong, right? So not just the class stuff, but the racist stuff. Like, so the, the policies that are racist aren't questioned because that's not part of the discussion because we're talking about representation. Does that make any sense at all? You were talking about Twitter. Like a really weird world. Yeah, no, that's true. So I'm trying. Yeah, but I mean, I, I guess I, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I don't think class. Oh, I mean, race is not an invisible discussion, right? Or an invisible. It's not all class. That's the other thing. It's like I don't think that that it's an either or, as corny and obvious as it sounds. But um, um, yeah. in the Clinton campaign, too, um, gender was used purposefully to elide class. Like we're all women. We all have this in common. So this is why you should vote for me. So should we yeah. conveniently open it up to a Q&A? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, go, it's there, and then we'll just go from left to right, just physically, nothing else. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. Is there some, like, elevator music we play while this yeah. happens? Yeah, that would be great, just to help everyone here. And if anyone has issues coming up to this space, we'll find someone that can go to you to help your question. Great. I had one quick comment that I'm curious if the panelists would agree or disagree, and then a second question. So one, it seems that the object lesson of this election is that the Democratic Party is not on the left. That whatever left candidate you put up for the Democratic Party, the party will sink the left candidate. That this has been now fully been put in the open. Moreover, that at least a great part of working people in America have decided that the Democratic Party is not their party. Which shouldn't come to a surprise for us, right? Because for the last 40 to 50 years, the Democratic Party has been at war with working people. So it's kind of strange that they would think that they could just count on that vote. So that's a comment. I'm just curious what you think about it. Um, the second is a question about the identity politics uh, bit. Because I actually I think it's quite essential, and I agree with a lot of the things that the moderator said, that it seems like we're talking about identity politics as a political strategy, right? So not whether or not we care about colored people, women, etc., but rather what it means to have it through the Democratic Party, the representational identity politics, right? That if she's a woman and you're a woman, somehow your life will be better. That somehow we've now discovered that this is not how the world works, that working women, in fact, don't do better if there's a woman in power, and black people don't do better when there's a black president. So why don't we just get rid of that model in terms of a political strategy? Because I don't think that it means neglecting black people's lives or women's lives. It seems to me that you can take, for example, Black Lives Matter and say, okay, so the state, the police, the executive power of the state is capable of killing poor working black people. You could take two different assumptions from this. You can say, well, white people are just racist. 
Or you could say, well, why, do, why are we structuring a society in which you can have the executive force of the state kill poor working people, whether that be white, black, etc. Um, so it seems to me that what you guys were struggling through is thinking about identity politics as a political strategy and what it might offer, um, and I really appreciated your comments, Catherine, uh, what it might offer to say that we all live under the same social experience of having to sell our labor in the market, no matter what race or gender you are, and what that means for our politics. So I would wonder to know if that's a quite like if that's a question that you think is worth considering identity politics being a bunk political strategy that is not caring not the not caring about you know immigrants like me etc but rather the class part of it. Thank you. Also, do you guys have like solo cups? These are very. Sorry, may I ask what your button is? I actually, I wanted to say something really quickly about that because... Um, you probably know what button she's wearing. Yeah, I, I see the button. Black is affiliated society and things kind of um, I, I just want to say, I think, again, because I'm in the university setting and this is a very alive debate there and I know in other places as well, really quickly, that I think part of the problem, part of the problem for me is, is um, uh, uh, okay, I'll just say it, is generational, which is to say that there's a lot of my young students who feel experience is pure knowledge. That is your experience is pure knowledge. And I, I don't feel that's the case. And I think that gets in the way of a lot of really complicated discussions about class and race that need to happen. Um, I'll let my co-panelists speak. Uh, I, I do think th this doesn't have to be an either or thing either. I, I, I mean, like, obviously we end up accidentally making those those sort of distinctions without meaning to, but I mean, I, I believe actually very strongly in representation. Um, I'm just extremely skeptical of it when liberals are doing it. Um, I, I also think, you know, well, we're at Verso right now, uh, publishing is a perfect example. That's a, a, a professional industry that has recently been overwhelmed by, um, you know, a, a highly feminine workforce, and it's formed a pink collar ghetto. I mean, that's what happens when, when representation uh, becomes um, the end uh, and not the means. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, I, I think the issue here is, is how to talk about identity without being identitarian and without seeing identity as like some sort of kind of final result, which tends to happen when liberals deal with identity because they don't have a material foundation for, for a conception of identity. So again, I, I actually do think representation matters. I'm just, again, skeptical of it. Any more white one, by the way? I agree. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I, when I, I think that it's not representation not being important, it's representation being, substituting everything else, right? So it's like the talent, um, having a more diverse, I feel like the Clinton campaign is like, is about having a more diverse, not the, the, the Clintons don't want a 1%, they don't want, I think they want, in all credit to them, a 10%, and they want it to be more diverse. Like that, I think, is Clintonianism. And that, to me, is, yeah, I think it's, it's better than a all white, straight male 1%. I still don't think it's the solution, and my, and I guess the, f I think what is scary about it is it's more deceptive than just the straight white male 1%, right? It's a, Propaganda. Yeah. Well, there are issues with the way neoliberals love targeted benefits. They like means testing and targeted social programs rather than universal ones. And that really sets, you know, the people who are barely getting by against people who don't have a pot to piss in. And that's really, you know, that exacerbates the worst kinds of racial tensions in the society. So we have all these existing fissures and social policy, neoliberal style, like Obamacare, for example. You know, you have the, the Medicare, Medicaid expansion, which is the best part of it, but that is a public program. Program. That's sort of expanding the public program. That's an unmitigated, you know, that's just an unmixed good. And then all this stuff, the complexities in the middle of the subsidies and all that craziness, um, that's a perfect example of the, the fissures that that kind of neoliberal social policy, market driven social policy, deepens, you know, it de deepens these pre existing fissures in society. And it's the, exactly the opposite of what we should be doing is like, you know, emphasizing universality and not targeting the way um, Hillary types love to do. 
Yeah, I will point out, I actually wrote about a little bit about this this week. Um, Americans are notoriously despised in, um, social, pl social things like that, social welfare plans like that, unless they are universal. That is why Social Security is considered the third rail of American politics, because everybody uses it. Um, and that is a real issue. And I think, you know, we know from social research that when you go into these communities, you will find the, the enormous resentment isn't among the people who aren't getting by at all. It's among the people who are just getting by, convinced everybody else is getting a free ride. Um, and that book, Hillbilly Elegy, that came out this year, and I'll use it as an example because it's not really about race. It's He is looking down on the people just below him, where he's working in the store, and these other people are coming in and using food stamps um, to buy stuff that I think it was, was it cig it's cigarette, he, I think cigarettes and soda, and, and junk food, and for, yeah, and he, he's like horrified by this, right? And I think you really can't forget that. Um, there is also some evidence to show that as helpful as um, Obamacare has been for the people who did not have insurance and the Medicaid expansion, which was fantastic, the fact is, is it seems like, to the best we can tell from the polling, and again, this is, is very diffuse because nobody's really gone in and asked this specific question, but it seems like people are using Obamacare and the ACA as a proxy for all health care. So if you ask them if they're angry about it, they think, I think they think their own costs are going up. And in fact, they are right. Their own costs are going up. Um, for people who have had um, employer-provided health insurance, premiums went up 13% last year. Um, or is this deductible? I'm sorry. And, um, you know, over time, out-of-pocket expenses since 2010 are up by just under 60%. Um, if anybody in this room has gotten a 60% raise since 2010, come up to me afterwards, I'd like to meet you. Um, so you can share your secret with all of us here. But I think people are using these things as proxies, and in their head, they're seeing somebody else get a freebie, and they're really angry. So on the identity politics issue, I think there are two fronts that we're working on here. In the university, as Elaine tells it, you know, we are working with a generation of men, mostly white, who want to retain their privilege. And I will use every tool of identity politics in that struggle against them. But in the ground, uh, in the struggle on the ground right now in building a big coalition politics, I think that we have to look at a different form of solidarity. And that's all. I mean, I, I, I think that there's a false, like, uh, dichotomy also like so a lot of the the discussion among liberals right is and the left or I would say between the liberals and the left is that like it's just racism or it's except no one's really saying it's just class I think that like people are pretending that one side is saying it's just class and one side is saying it's just racism okay yeah they're saying it's just class <laughs> um, no but I, I do think that like w what you have are people who are saying it's it's like we we won't talk about class stuff. We, that's that's that, that's vulgar, vulgar Marxism or something, right? And then the response to the idea that class has any relationship to to what happened in Brexit or what happened with Trump is is often people po pointing to polls, post you know exit polls, where people are interviewed and they're asked what m made them vote for Brexit or what made them vote for Trump, right? And and they say immigrants instead of neoliberal policy. Or immigrants instead of globalization, because those terms, neoliberal policies and globalization, resonate so much with people, right? Like that—that that is, I think, something that's happening that's extremely frustrating. Which is the idea that um, I, I guess I just see it as not a. Uh, I see it, the, the the discussion as being way too either or. Although I only I see one side as being much more um, d dominant, yeah, than the other. No, no. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't see hands up. That's, yeah. Raise them high, please. Yeah, you can stand in line in the aisle. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, I thought you guys no longer wanted to ask a question. Sorry. Yeah, you were saying... Sorry about that. All right. Yeah, you were saying about um, uh, some of your friends on Facebook and the people in the establishment media uh, basically going in full on denial. But on the other side of the coin, how many do you sense people that have gone reverse, like that were gung ho for Clinton, but now think, you know, maybe, you know, she was a terrible candidate and maybe Bernie Sanders or would have won. That was my mom after election day. She was very gung ho for Bernie swallowed the Russia 
the stupid, really stupid Russia campaign point, like uh, like a hungry baby bird. But now she's just, she said, you know, maybe she was a terrible candidate and Bernie would have won. She she, regret, she threw up. Yeah, Good more way. or less. I mean, the, the Russia thing. She, sorry, it's not probably the best object. On your I am. It's a problem. That's why I need you to tell me what to do. I'm Jenny Brown. I'm with uh, na uh, National Women's Liberation, and I'm going to follow Catherine's lead of trying to be risky. And um, so our group uh, usually has about 20 or 30 people at the New York chapter meetings, and we announced our meeting, and we now have 912 people saying they're going to come. So I think there's some potential for feminist organizing in this moment. And so we were trying to think about how to use the opening that Trump, Pence are such extreme male supremacists. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to read this slight proposal. And I realize, just keep in mind, I'm, be I'm trying to be risky and do things that may not quite work. Um, so this is. Uh, for the many of us who have family members who voted for Trump. Calling all women to join us in a two-day strike on all our jobs, paid and unpaid. Strike in D.C., strike in your hometown, strike at home. This is an emergency. Stop the Trump, Pence, and Republican Congress's plans for us. We're on strike from housework, dishes, fake smiles, flirting, child care, our paid jobs, cooking. Strike 9 a.m. Friday, January 20th, Inauguration Day, to 5 p.m. Saturday, January 21st, Women's March on Washington Day. We strike for an end to racist and sexist assaults, reproductive freedom, Medicare for all, everybody in, nobody out, $15 an hour minimum wage, all workers, no exceptions, protect and expand Social Security, paid family leave, not just maternity, at at least six months like they have in 50 other countries, and respect. Men should strike too, but they should take on the additional work at home so women can fully participate in demonstrations, trans and non-binary folk, welcome and wanted. Um, let's show the men in our families, workplaces, and communities who voted for these anti-woman candidates we're done. This is no joke. We're not cleaning up the mess they've made. We refuse to fill in for the destruction of every social compact from the schools to health care to social security. They expect the family, that is women, to do the work Work that makes life bearable and viable. No, we won't. To Trump and Pence and all the men who supported them, this strike is just a warning. Our work will not be taken for granted. So, do I have to take a strike from flirting, though? <laughs> it's only 24 hours. Okay. It's a long time. What, disrupt, uh, it's subversive flirting. It's fine. Oh, okay. okay. I'll flirt with Or use initiate it. It's fine. So I wanted to just ask about um, one of. Can you speak up? Sure. Uh, in her introduction, Liza made a good formulation of the opportunities that this moment presents for left politics. In so far as it, uh, she she talked about kicking this type of politics when it's down, and I think that maybe what she meant was the politics of the status quo, the Democratic Party. Um, and I would like to know how many of you uh, think what that looks like might be something like pushing the existing Democratic Party to the left via candidates and leaders like Bernie Sanders, um, or, or how many of you think that it might take a different form, uh, in, you know, perhaps um, somehow uh, engaging in the destruction of the current Democratic Party, putting something else in its place, building a different type of party politics. Um, how many of you, you know, have thoughts on that? I'm writing the questions down so we can do it. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the panel. Um, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Um, I think that is relevant to mention here. Um, and I, I have two just really simple questions. Um, simple in, in theory, but maybe difficult to answer. Um, what do we do? That's okay. What do we do with the I'm still with her crowd? And how do we connect to to disaffected Trump voters. Uh, 
Hi, uh, I just wanted to add a little bit about uh, the Latino vote and to the conversation because uh, I think it's very relevant. Um, so uh, I think the Latino vote for the Democratic candidate for Hillary was uh, seriously uh, underestimated and um, I've been doing research along the state of Arizona for a couple years now, and it comes as no surprise, this sort of disillusionment with the Democratic Party, uh, so turnout was low, but uh, when there is so much fear in light of the other candidate, uh, where he's uh, calling us criminals and rapists, and um, even though we've had record deportations uh, under Obama, uh, it just puts us in this very difficult situation where uh, we become Latino first and foremost and how do we keep our families together um, even though you know it seems like neither party is really representing us um, so I just thought it was uh, very s parallel supportive to sort of uh, Donna's area of research uh, and that's it just a comment <laughs> No, I just I, I think you should answer those questions because okay. that was a whole bunch. Okay, so we're gonna pause. Yeah. For, um, so we got a strike who's joining. Um, the kicking down the left. Does that mean I'm summarizing? Sorry. Does, is that like Bernie route or Keith Allison, or like just saying no to the DNC? Um, and then what do we do with the I'm still with her? Crowd, I would say therapy for them, um, and to disaffected Trump voters. Sorry, that was able. And to disaffected Trump voters, and then um, talking about the Latino vote and the turnout. I, I guess I'm, I'm probably the least anti-Bernie person, maybe in the room. I, mean, I was a hundred percent all in. No, no, no. Oh, oh. <laughs> We're Bernie bros. Okay, and then I'm a Bernie bro with you, and so I kind of thought when all my friends suddenly started to criticize Bernie on everything I could think of, I was like, oh, please unfriend me. I'm too afraid. I feel bad unfriending people. I was hoping they would unfriend me. I did too, thank you. Uh, but but I, I feel like, you know, one of the things that went on in my head, and I'm being really honest here, is I was like, how much of a purist am I willing to be? How much do I feel like I have to live in the real world? How much am I willing to say I'm going to sit in a room with four people smoking, talking about Bernie on uh, Israel and Palestine? I'm not going to do that. Um, and I feel it was a huge moment for a lot of people on the left, and um, probably Catherine, maybe this is true, I know Amber, every single student I had except for two were Bernie voters and I have 65 students in semester. Every single one. That is the future of American politics and so what I say to this, I'm still with her people is I'll see you later because you are fucked and you are wrong and you are going and the yes um, and there's a reason, you know, that old cliche, the rear view mirror is smaller than the, uh, the windshield. We are looking at a big picture, and that vote is in the past. I was curious when you said earlier, American love dynastic presidencies. I don't think they do anymore. I think the Kennedy era, the Bush era. She hates them. They hate them. They hate. Oh, you hate? I thought you said they like them. I was like, oh, yes, no, they hate them now, and now I don't think they will ever ever happen again in my lifetime that a candidate will be a dynastic candidate. I mean, uh, but... She's running for Congress. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I would point out is that, um, you know, there's an old joke in political circles that, you know, if you give catch, if you give uh, people a choice between a real Republican and a fake Republican, they'll vote for the real Republican every time. Um, and I think that the Democratic Party would be really something they should keep in mind. Um, this seems to have happened, and this happened in this election, too, when Hillary Clinton thought she had it in the bag, and she, you know, started to appeal to the the suburban upper middle class voters, and it did run up the totals in places like New York and California, which is really wonderful. But that's not going to get you into the White House, unfortunately, as the case turned out to be. And um, the fact is, is if you know you're going to be sort of Republican light, you're not going to get anywhere. That's just a sad fact for the most part for these for for the um, establishment. And the reason it goes on is because the the the, um, the interests of the money crowd are very different from the voter crowd. And the Democrat, this is, is a big an issue for the Republican Party because they seem to have figured out somehow to say X and then take the money and do Y and they get a lot of people to go along with them, probably because of the unspoken racism within the party or the spoken racism as the case may be. 
And the Democratic Party obviously has a bigger issue with this. Um, and they get called on it time and time and time again. Um, and I think part of the issue here is not just um, all we've talked about, but is campaign finance reform so that Democrats can be Democrats. Uh, on that, um, I think this is a point in which many no, of us can uh, just leave it to you. Is the mic not on? Yeah, yeah. Now you're good. Okay. So I think this is a point on which many of us can agree. I was also very, uh, I was a huge Sanders supporter, and I saw a whole set of new coalitions being created in the Sanders campaign that really mattered, that were interesting, and they were very underreported by the media. You know, one of the things that I saw, and I participated in the campaign some, was that, you know, for example, in South Carolina, 41% of black millennials supported Sanders in the primary. And they had a remarkable organizing campaign that took place at the historically black colleges, and there was outreach. But one of the issues that was brought up in the Sanders campaign, and I, I knew the organizers and talked to them about it, had to do with questions of disfranchisement, which are very important within the Democratic Party, not only Democratic versus Republican Party. So essentially, the Sanders campaign was an insurgent campaign that didn't have name recognition. You know, part of being a dynasty is you have name recognition. So even though Americans resent that, right, but they also know your name, which helps a lot with voting. But they're talking about just the constraints and how to register new voters. And I think if I had to talk about moving forward, things that I see as important, um, there's an independent independent organizing piece and then there's an electoral piece. I'll start with the electoral piece. Um, you know, it, I'm happy to see petitions circulating yesterday and today about the electoral college, you know, talking about the need for electoral reform. It's very, you know, very clear. Really sustain campaigns against voter disfranchisement because the truth is I don't think that the Democrats, it may surprise, well, and it doesn't surprise anyone in this room, outside this room it would surprise people. The Democrats have not worked that hard against voter disfranchisement. And there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, Fran Piven and Lori Minetti's book on keeping the black vote down talks about this. And it was clear in the Sanders campaign because precisely the kinds of populations that they were trying to organize, which are in many ways the most excluded, were not registered to vote. So they were experiencing this even as an insurgent campaign inside the Democratic Party. So one is things about fight for electoral reform. Obviously, fights against Citizen United, electoral college, questions about the structuring of the primary system, the fact that California comes last, you know, you know how marginalized the large states are. I think kind of mainstream electoral reform matters a lot. It affected the Sanders campaign a great deal. But then the second piece is obviously independent organizing. Um, the hopeful thing that I draw from the possibilities of this election is that, you know, the Clintons, of course, the, the DNA of the Democratic Leadership Council is from the Clintons themselves, and it has been, it has been blown, it has, it has suffered a devastating blow. What's going to happen, I'm not sure, because the truth is, I've been so upset since Trump was elected that I haven't had a chance to really begin that process of studying what's being said, what's going on inside the Democratic Party, how they're going to think about this. But my hope is to see, you know, and maybe some other people in the panel can talk about what's going on with our revolution and the 501c4. I was very nervous when there was that big split with Jeff Weaver about 501c4 versus 501c3, about kind of big money in politics. So that question of down ballot elections um, and kind of, you know, Bernie-esque redistributive programs um, and thinking about you know, a redistributive politics. And that's what I want to talk about. That's why I push back so hard about, let's not have an old debate about race versus class. The redistributive politics of the Sanders campaign were very effective. And I think that that's the way to move forward, not questions of apologia about the racism of people that have supported Trump adamantly. So I think that that, to me, is what I see as, as hope. And I'm, I'm really curious about how this is going to be received by Democrats. I just have a couple of disconnected observations. One is Sanders' uh, agenda was virtually identical to the NAACP's reparation agenda. And like, you know, it had a lot of fight, you know, Sanders didn't come out for reparations and I, all this back and forth, but you know, it's basically there. But he was, uh, he was honest about it as opposed to Clinton who gave a BS not Well, yeah, well, you know, yeah, she, I know, I know, I you know, she, couldn't, here, yeah. she couldn't tell you the time of day truthfully, I don't think. Um, so that's one thing. Um, but, you know, 
the, the Democratic Party is their perpetual problem. Uh, Sanders would have gotten nowhere if he hadn't run as a Democrat. He would be Jill Stein otherwise. But then the Democratic Party crushed him. So like, this is the paradox. How do we break out of this? And you know, I'm all for people taking both routes. I think uh, some people might want to move inside the Democratic Party, try to transform it the way the right took over the Republican Party, starting from the 50s through the 70s, quite successfully. They had more money behind them, but you know. We are many, and they are a few, one hopes. Um, but also, uh, you know, third party organizing, and I wish the Greens would grow up and be more serious and less embarrassing. Uh, but also, uh, organizing around issues, instead of just this, the pollution of electoral politics. It's, this presidential campaign went on for almost 600 days. Now people are going to start talking about the midterm elections. They've already started talking about that. And, you know, God knows, we're going to start talking about the 2020 presidential campaign. Predict it, which I spent too much time following and, you know, turned out to be quite wrong. But they, they already have a contract now. Who's going to be the 2020 nominee? Uh, like, really, this is just sick. Um, so organizing around things like defending immigrants uh, uh, or... You know, living wage is fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage, or, or single payers in states, um, labor law reform, all kinds of things like organizing around those things around these goddamn elections. You know, make the elected officials respond to social movements uh, rather than spending so much time deciding who the personnel is going to be. You know, many politicians are up to a point completely unprincipled and um, um, very plastic. And you know, if they they saw enough force moving things. Uh, outside the electoral arena, they might respond. So I, there's just too much damn attention paid uh, to elections. And it's really, um, it's just diseased. And this is something that liberals always want to do. We have to start, who are we going to you know, run in 2018 and all this business? Like, can we, you know, uh, I mean, in a lot of ways, elections are the enemies of politics. Mm -hmm. I think one of the other big issues we haven't talked about is um, free public higher education and the abolition of student loan debt. And um, one of those things that uh, lies like a cloud over so many young people. And Bernie really did speak to them, and we pushed Hillary to um, talk to these issues more. And yes, I agree with you, Donna. The redistributive politics begins maybe right there, and um, fully funded um, state public higher education, funding K through 12 adequately. Those are things that people on the ground care about. One of the things that I think pantsuit feminism does not emphasize enough is free child care care, parental and maternity leave, getting back to these kinds of bread and butter issues. And that's what I think we can all get behind on, people on. And um, for me, student loan debt is the shackle, the chain and shackles of, um, and the downward mobility force for your generation. And it kills me every day that my students have to learn under those conditions. And I don't think anyone can even think clearly when they live with that kind of anxiety. And I think that all of this immaterial stuff that we debate about in terms of identity politics in the um, university masks this general massive exploitation world. You have to mortgage your futures to like be free thinkers. And so. Speaking of, um, of the NAACP and of our revolution, I had on my show this week on Tuesday, Ben Jealous, who, the former head of the NAACP, who's on the board of our revolution, which is basically the Bernie Sanders uh, continuation. Uh, 50, what? It became a 501c4. Yeah, 501c4. Right. right. And so you can listen uh, to my show. For, oh, it's not up yet. But you should subscribe to my show. Anyway. Okay, it will be up soon. But he talks about how, why he needs, I mean, I honestly don't know enough about campaign finance stuff, but he basically is like, we need to have enough money to, to do this stuff. And, and what he said was also that um, they were focused really more on 2018 and 2020. But he's also, I mean, very much aware of like the, the importance of, of social movements. But lest you distrust him in any way, he literally at like, what was 6.30 p.m., I asked him, I thought he was gonna come on the show and tell people why we had to vote for Hillary even though we like Bernie, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, yeah, fear that Trump gets elected because there are unlikely voters and people are assuming that the unlikely voters, we usually talk about Latino and black unlikely voters, the people who are related to, um, who we talk about when we talk about the Voting Rights Act. But there are going to be a lot of unlikely white voters, cicada voters, who don't come out for, you know, who've been not voting for 10 or 20 years. <laughs> cicada voters, that's what, yeah, as he goes, that's what they're called. And they, um, all I do when I do stuff is quote my guests. It's, I'm like the best hype woman. So, um, so 
and then he said, and these, these under this population, he said, of less educated, lower income white voters are moved by two things that are sometimes overlapping. One are, is celebrity politicians, people who've come off as not being political elites or insiders. Everyone from Jesse Ventura to Sonny, Sonny Bono to the guy from The Love Boat, um, who was an Iowa congressman, to Trump. And the other cause is extremist causes. The other thing that moves people are extremist causes. So, um. a celebrity thing, just for a minute, as someone you know who studies, as many of you do, I guess in some way, celebrity culture. I was stunned at Clinton's shitty celebrity choices. I, I was if had, stunned. If she had no one likes Lena Dunham. That's no, true. no, that is something that unites a lot of different. Nothing says right. I'm serious like Katy Perry. I mean, what? Do you ever feel like a paper bag? Uh, uh, what happened? You know, plastic. Sorry, you see. I mean, it, it, it's a it's a minor, much less important point than the other points we're talking about. But it just does bear right. discussing briefly that the youth vote thought that was hilariously stupid and that she thought like Katy Perry is emailing you was gonna like suddenly the music is light, catchy, yeah though. light up yes. but light up anything so I, I was sort of sort of like you I was like why don't you just get George Clooney and Julia in a room early on maybe the you problem know. is she got Clooney but then he basically agreed with Sanders that they were spending way too much money on this stuff and Disgusting. Of course, but what I mean is like get your celebrity message on point. Really? You're like, you know, I mean, everyone thinks Sarah Silverman is more interesting than Kim. Like, so I, I, I was stunned by this. I was like, how toned up? Do you watch television? Like, I, uh, you know, you know what would have made the difference? Television. I know, but I, she, I thought Netflix maybe she wouldn't. She should have got dollars in the best political professionals in the world, and they just ran the stupidest campaign. Yeah. Well, she you know what she messed up on. She didn't get Henry Kissinger's endorsement, which that that was. A game changer. But also, I think that, um, um, I, I do think that, um, sorry, I just, someone made a life-threatening motion, which uh, I misinterpreted. What were we just saying? And then, uh, not in a threat, like in a celebrity stuff. Um, oh, this is so unpopular. Hillary Clinton was not charismatic, and all the stuff people say about we're more sexist than racist, I just don't think it's a fair enough, controlled enough experiment. Obama is extremely appealing, and we don't like to think this stuff matters. We like to think it's policy and stuff, but it, it is personality. He He's magnetic, and he's like seems like a total underdog, and, and at the same time connected. Hillary doesn't, and I think that, and there's sexism, misogyny, racism, classism, all that stuff too, but I, I do think it's a dangerous thing to kind of compare one white woman and one black man, and then take away all these lessons about like racism, sexism. I'm not saying anyone at the table I'm did just saying that. charismatic authority makes me me super nervous. Sure, it does. It, it does. I get it. I but it also gets people to vote for them. Or Can I add something yeah. to that, though? You know, Obama, I think, is a brilliant politician. And precisely oh, yeah. many of the things that he did that, that personally alienated me and horrified me were, were very tactical political decisions, starting with the repudiation of Reverend Wright. I hated that. I was very upset because about that. That's when I started liking him over Hillary, was that? Well, I hated that. I mean, I personally thought it was horrible. The racism, the complex racial politics of it to me were obvious. I'm saying I personally didn't like it. But I can separate what I think personally from what I understand is a political, tactical decision. Obama's entire persona was crafted around, I am the president of America, not the president of Afro-America. Now, for African Americans, this had some terrible implications, like his Morehouse speech, where he talked about Pookie needing to pull up his pants. So this is what I mean about racism. Racism is very important. Part of the way that Obama created himself as all of America was to appeal to racial tropes. So it does matter. What I did see, and I can name the things that he did tactically to try to speak to broad constituencies, and you know, he was the, his entire persona was about reaching across the aisle, right? Appealing to the people that don't like you. Choosing an evangelical minister to speak at his own inauguration. Many of us were very upset about 
that. He chose a white evangelical minister. But of course, we understood what he was doing. That was a tactical decision. So these are not things I personally agree with, but that I also understand that politicians do to win in a two-party system. It's very striking to me that Hillary Clinton did none of that. And one of the best examples was Wisconsin. Why didn't Hillary Clinton visit Wisconsin? Right? And there are a whole series of things. I'm willing to talk about this, about the limitations of her, of her campaign. And we know from 2008, look at all the mistakes that were made in 2008. Her campaign not understanding how caucus, the caucus system worked versus the, camp, versus the Obama campaign. The, you know, allowing her husband to come out and make the fairy tale comment in South Carolina, which alienated core black voters that they needed. So I, it's not, I wouldn't just describe it as Obama's charisma. Yes, he is charismatic. He has a presidential walk. He's attractive. But he's a very calculating politician. And it's precisely that, that calculating politician for me as a black leftist that has been devastating, but it also allowed him to be elected. Yeah, I just, wait, I have to clarify something because I can't go on record as, as saying, what I meant is when she started going after him because of Jeremiah Wright, that's when I liked Obama over Hillary. I don't want anyone to think I was saying that I liked that he repudiated him, just to clarify that. Okay, sorry. But the I Cousin Pookie yeah. remark was, most white people have no idea who Cousin Pookie is, so that was, wasn't that targeted to like upper income black voters? I don't know. When you go to, I think a portion of that, but you know, Pookie's made it into the mainstream. Pookie was in. There was a character Pookie that was in Spike Lee film. Spike Lee's film, Do the Right Thing. I know that white people saw Do the Right Thing. Well, uh, no. Wait, but can I, I, the white people here saw Do the Right Thing. But that's the same a, population a, saw. I think that's a yeah big assumption. But I think that um, you know, black culture has become very mainstream. Jay Z, you know, the kinds of the the public rhetoric about telling black men to pull up their pants and the attribution of black protest to essentially black behavior. You know, this is, it's classic, but, but I just mean the use of, really, you're, you're not going to, it's the cousin Pookie. Cousin Pookie, but there are many things that were said in that speech. The pull up your, the pull up your pants, the appeal, it's classic Moynihanism, the, the appeal to pull up your pants, that these are problems of behavior. And then ultimately that was also his initial response to Black Lives Matter, right, was that we need not only jobs campaigns, but these are problems of economics and behavior. But that was a tactical political decision. I really think so, probably even more so than ideology. So let's, would be just let's have... To remind us oh. that Kanye West is running in 2020. <laughs> so can we uh, yeah, get another right. question and then we can get, we can all respond. I just to wanted to open up to questions again, and I'm starting by asking my own question. <laughs> um, my question is, False Choices was really impactful, I think, partially because it focused on Hillary's political career outside of her electoral aims in a way that elucidated the DLC's tactic, um, as well as the kind of neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party, and her incredibly narrow and some would say myopic feminism. I was wondering if the panelists could talk about, especially those that contributed to false choices, what we can expect to see of those issues outside of the electoral process in the coming years because a lot of it focused on economic inequality, racism, dog whistle politics, etc. Those problems are only going to get worse, I think, under a Trump presidency, and they'll be talked about in a lot different of a way. So I was wondering if you could kind of point to areas of focus that will be really important in the coming years. One more question? Hi. Um, I'm Sarah Jones. I'm at the New Republic. Um, I first had an observation where I'm from central Appalachia, southwest Virginia, uh, specifically. And I read the other day the Traditionalist Workers Party is planning voter outreach there. Um, so a note to coalition building, if the Democrats don't do it, the Workers Traditionalist Party is. Um, second, I noticed uh, Trump split union voters with Hillary Clinton and I wanted to just hear people's thoughts about why that happened and was it a failure in union leadership? <laughs> Okay, and then you're the, you get the, the prize. You're the last question, and then we'll wrap it up. Great. Thanks so much to all the panelists for being here and everyone in the room. Uh, I have a pre-Thanksgiving question. <laughs> I find that this panel represents uh, 
an exercise that I find frustrating in my daily life when I have conversations with friends and colleagues. Often we find ourselves as members of the left arguing with other members of the left and other liberals and other neoliberals about how left the left should be. Knowing that many of us will soon be having conversations in the aftermath of the Trump election and hoping that we see friends and family members in the middle have buyer's regret with the election of Trump, what are the most useful practical conversations we can have, again, with people we know in the middle who don't identify as members of the left about how they can become activists and thoughtful political participants? I don't know if my family's like... I'll start and then I will go away because I didn't contribute to the book because that's actually a really important question and one of the things I actually emphasize is one of the things we do in this country is we don't acknowledge how dependent we are on, on, social, on government programs um, and there are studies of this most famously by Suzanne Mettler at Cornell University where if you ask people, roughly around 60% will say they've taken government aid at one point. The actual number is just shy of 100%. It's about 93, 94%. Most people actually don't recognize the mortgage deduction as government aid, which in fact it is. Um, a significant proportion of people who take Medicare, um, believe it or not, do not believe they're receiving help from the government, which is extraordinary. So there's a reason you saw signs at Tea Party gatherings that said, get the government's hands off my Medicare. There was really a, a group of people who didn't believe it was a government program. Um, similarly, um, Social Security is a program that benefits women more than men, um, though people don't realize that because they think it's just people over 65. In fact, from the age of 62 onward, majority of recipients are, are women, and by 85, it is two-thirds of recipients because women live longer than men. And so what I try to do is I emphasize to people that they are, in fact, recipients of government largesse. It is not just uh, the poor or darker people like they think. It is not just the unworthy like they think. It is themselves. Um, and I find that does occasionally have an impact. I don't want to say it often has an impact, but it sometimes has an impact. Any closing remarks, uh, plugs of websites, books, Twitter <laughs> handles? So I, I actually, like uh, responding to the earlier round of questions, someone brought up like the Democratic Party and like where this leaves the left and and I, we're all still a little, I think, shell-shocked here, so like, I just appreciate everyone for even showing up, and also I think everyone's a bit raw right now, so I appreciate, I will you know, give everyone a white berth, and I hope you will do the same for me. But, um, you know, when they, when I, whatever, Googled it and saw like Trump had won, I, I had this immediate like sickening thing, not because just of the immediate political effects, but honestly, the left has been really invigorated lately, specifically because, as Doug says, under democratic regimes, it's very good for resentment for, for liberals. Um, it, it's much easier for us to have something, to have them directly in power to criticize and on like a completely selfish level like I was worried about like the progress of like Jacobin and a magazine that I had for current affairs please subscribe and and you know my friends done podcasts that are like you know that are literally about criticizing liberals and you know the Katie Helper show you know things that are to the left of liberal and I was horrified because I remembered when I was working for Democratic Socialists of America um, we used to use the nation's mailing list and then the book Bush, and then the Bush years happened, and the nation stopped being a useful mailing list for us because it was no longer a sort of left publication. It was like an anti-Bush publication. And everyone became so focused on defeating Bush that they had no time for building an actual left. And I just want to say that is not what is happening right now. And I'm... I'm very, very <laughs> delusionally optimistic because the amount of subscriptions for Jacobin and like people joining DSA, which is like, I can't wait till they're so big that I can splinter off and call them social democrat reformists. And then uh, sabotage like, the entire movement. Yeah, so I like, uh, I, I'm just, I'm incredibly actually encouraged by the way people have responded. I, I was preparing for the worst, but honestly, I'm, I've been so impressed. And it's just always been the same choice, but now it's more obvious. It's always been socialism or barbarism. It's always it. And people, I think, can really rise to the occasion. Yeah.
I'm a little embarrassed to be in the debased position of finding myself quoting a Facebook post of my own. Um, but it's up to like 1,100 likes, so I think it's been market tested. Um, and I rec I'm probably the oldest person in the room, I suspect. Uh, and I actually remember very well when Reagan was elected. And it was crushing. It was absolutely just, the, the despair was so intense. My personal despair. But um, there, it was very lonely to be on the left in those days. It was very weird uh, to be on the left in those days. And it just felt like you were being crushed by the tide of history. This feels different. There is a, actually a very active left now. Uh, and. I think we could be prepared to play a leading role in opposition to Trump. And all these useless, I'm still with her people, need to be shunted aside and identified as the enemy and you know, like crushed with steamrollers. Yeah. Yes, if they repent. They need to be re if they repent, they're welcome to yeah, join yeah, yeah. us. But uh, if, self criticism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're self, <laughs> self care. So, no, not so, self criticism, not self care. Not self -care. <laughs> That's our new lie. That's how we just spin it to them. <laughs> So as awful as, as the idea of a President Trump and an Attorney General Giuliani and all those horrible things that are be afflicting us in the coming years, it doesn't feel, you know, there, there are consolations that, um, that, uh, that, that there's, there is more active left now. But I also feel a need to, you know, like cling together with my comrades in a, you know, a loving, solidaristic way. <laughs> Susie Bright once said to me um, that workers of the world unite is an erotic sentiment and, you know, I think we, we could use some of that eros right now, too. Eros for the revolution. <laughs> eros for the revolution. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, what I, the, I wanted to address the question about the union workers being split, and I feel like I'm optimistic, too, because I feel like one of the ways in which we can talk about redistribution now, because the Democratic Party's abandoned union workers and abandoned workers in general, is that we're moving towards a realization that there are bosses and we are workers. Because I think one of the things about the Clinton years, when that first bubble um, was inflated, was that there was massive atomization, self-entrepreneurialism, the things that the mass, the competition and the individualism of these past 30 years have made everyone miserable, anxious, and depressed. And the only happiness is to be found in collective happiness. And I think that we can lead the way in terms of that because the Democrats are not the class of the working people. And we have to make ourselves, we can be the class of the working, we can be the party of the working people. I was going to say something, but it's a big downer. <laughs> well, you can if someone has an upper for afterwards. Any, any? Do I have something lined up? Yeah, I'll do it. Sure, I'll, I'll do it. Whatever you say, I'll just pretend that. I've, yeah, go. It's just the historian me. You know, this is not the first time that half of union households have voted for a Republican. You know, the in 1966 when Ronald Reagan was running against Pat Brown, uh, half of union households supported Ronald Reagan, and I saw this as the real genesis of what became the culture war in the 1980s. So Ronald Reagan used a platform of um, anti, what was it? Anti-beatnik, anti-rioter, essentially. So it was about the anti-war movement, the student movement, and then the urban rebellions. And I think that was a very seminal moment in American history, where union households voted for someone who wanted a right-to-work state in California because they were worried about the black rebellions and student protest. And that's why this intersection between race and class is quite important. Simply pulling them apart and treating them as, as oppositional and separate is impossible. And so for me, Trump has many echoes, you know, going all the way back, not just to the presidency of Reagan, but back to 1966. And it's one of the reasons that I'm ambivalent. I'm very critical of Hillary Clinton and her shortcomings in the Democratic Leadership Council, the culpability in the war on drugs, and really the failures of the Clinton campaign. But I also really want to... Um, emphasize the the racism that was important to this election. I think it was actually absolutely central, the anti-Mexican racism and the shifting demographics going on in the United States. You know, each election is distinct from another, and I think that the changing demographics, the rapid increase of the Latino population, the naming of Mexicans as rapists, the argument that Muslims should wear ID badges, there were multiple things in play in this that I think need to be talked about simultaneously as we talk about the need to transform the Democratic Party. 
The, the, it's an upper or if it's not, you can't. It's, it's, a, it's a slight upper. So um, one of the things that has been discussed recently is that um, the National Union uh, organizations were very quick to endorse Hillary Clinton, and those ones that, that did this, they did so without any consultation with their membership. And, and um, you know, this is an alienating act um, because Hillary Clinton is not seen by many of those who didn't vote for her as, as representing the interests of workers. So one of the things that hopefully, um, in, in sort of a Bob Fitch moment, uh, I think might emerge is that perhaps national leadership of trade unions might take members' interests more seriously, try to be more democratic, be led by rank and file, because if they don't, they're just going to die off. I mean, you know, we're looking at the reality of a right to work law, a national right to work law being passed now. Um, and so this is a direct result of their irresponsible leadership. Um, so the n n national, the AFT, which is uh, the union that I'm in, as, as well as Megan, uh, Randy Weigarten wanted to be the Secretary of Labor, and that's what motivated her when the teacher were like, no, she's not a friend to, to workers, she's not a friend to teachers, she's not a friend to education. So I'd like to see maybe the rank and file, those of us who are in unions, to push for more of this, because otherwise they're ensuring that they're not going to have jobs. Yeah, the, the union leadership. Yeah, I think they will if, they, if we, if the membership demands that they do. And I think also it's really important to remember the historical role that unions have played, like mostly prior to the 1950s, of um, uniting people uh, by um, you know people of different races in in a common class struggle, and and that was very real. Um, the TU, TU, which is the teachers union that preceded the UFT in New York City, was like on the streets advocating for Afrocentric curriculum and for economic justice for students. So I I think that um, that points the way towards where we should be looking as we organize as well. Bert, for birthing uh, this <laughs> book and this event. So, Liza the Featherstone. And thank you, Verso Books. And thanks, thanks for coming. Can we just give another round of applause to our panelists and Liza? Thanks for coming out. Oh, and yeah, to the contributors. It's also. Helpful in these dark days. We have wine and books, and if anyone needs directions to any of the numerous protests, yeah, seriously, um, contact a Verso staff member and we'll try to help you get there. Thank you.